to greater things. Amen. God, love you. God bless you. Go love God. Love each other. And go change the world. And happy birthday, happy anniversary, six years now. And uh, man, you got a special like anniversary bulletin when you came in. It looks like like a newspaper. And, uh, and in there, it, it's just, it has just a few things that God has done. Over 8,000 people saved over our six years. Isn't that awesome, you guys? 540 baptized, 660 people part of the dream team using their gifts to make a difference. Man, it's just it's been so fun. It's been such an amazing ride. And I want to just take a moment and do some reflection with you and do some remembering. All throughout the Bible, that, that word remember shows up a lot. The Bible encourages us to pause and to reflect, like to just look back and just give God glory for what he's done. Look at it with me in Deuteronomy chapter 6 out of the message paraphrase. It says like this, that when God your God ushers you into the land he promised. So he's going to do some things and show up for you and actually take you places where you didn't even think that you would go. It says, through your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you, you're going to walk into large bustling cities that you didn't build. So what he's saying is that God is going to do much more than what you ever imagined. And he goes, you're going to take well-furnished, continue please, well-furnished houses you didn't buy, come upon wells you didn't dig, vineyards and olive orchards you didn't plant. And so, listen, I think it's very important for us to recognize this, that before Discovery came on the scene six years ago, there were so many people working the soil of Bakersfield. We didn't just come on the scene six years ago and go, oh, look, everything just this magically appeared. No, there were people, ministers and people praying and working the soil, even in your lives. Like, you didn't just come, Discovery shows up and comes. Some of you, yeah, but you're actually the product of praying moms and praying grandmas, and mentors, and people influencing your life. So I want us to acknowledge that. that, that it's, it's, there's some things that we say, yeah, we did this, but we didn't do this. I mean, we did, we did that, but man, we didn't do that. God did that. We didn't have anything. Wow, he did so much more. We're walking into things that we didn't even expect. We didn't sow this, but we're reaping some benefits of it. I want you to see that, because he says, when you take it all in, like when you take it all in, you settle down and you're pleased, and you're content, make sure you don't forget how you got there. So church, we can't, we can't forget how we got here. So I want to I retell the story of discovery. And my staff loves it when I tell the story. They, they, they tell me, Pastor, you got to tell the story. You got to tell them. So let me give you the, the condensed version of the story if you haven't, haven't heard it before. Um, it was actually years ago before we even started Discovery. I was on White Lane right here at, at the Gosford intersec intersection, and I was so surprised at how much Southwest Bakersfield had grown. And, and I, was, I remember being frustrated at the traffic, and I think I was even hangry. Like, it was bad. I was not in a good mood at the traffic, and I'm at this light, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, when did Southwest blow up? On? And it was in that moment that the Holy Spirit just spoke to me, and as I looked around, he said, the Holy Spirit spoke to my spirit, said, look around, you're going to pastor some of these people in traffic with you. And, and that broke me. And in that moment, God gave me a picture. He gave me a vision. And I've never, I've never shared that picture that God had given me in that moment. And I'm going to share it with you. For six years, I never shared it. Because he gave me a picture, and I, I, I didn't want to, for us to like be chasing a crowd. or anything. So I was careful not to share. But what he showed me in that moment was thousands of people in theater seating. And I, wanted, and I was careful not to share this with you because I don't want anyone to think or you to think or for us to go run in the wrong direction because we're not chasing a crowd. We're chasing God, people. Amen? But it's what he gave me. He showed me something. And I broke down and I cried. And it wasn't for much it was years later that we finally embarked out and shared this vision of a new church with a few families. And we begin to meet in a home. We called them vision gatherings. And we only had two gatherings in this home. The first gathering, we, there was like two living spaces, a living room and another living room, and it was like overflowing. And then we had our second vision gathering the next month, and it was just like, it was overflowing. There was no more room. People were committing and saying, we want to be a part of this. And, and we were thinking like, this is, this is too much and too soon. We're not ready for this. And the Holy Spirit spoke again and said, no, it's time. 
And, and he called us to go out and sign a lease before we were even launched. So we actually leased a place right around the corner on Shiraz Court. And you probably remember Shiraz Court. If you've been here for three years, at least three years, you would remember Shiraz Court, but not this one. Because this one is when we started. We first leased it, one building for kids and one unit. I mean, one unit for kids and one unit for the adults. And the, the adults had like this small strip. And we called it the sardine box because we packed in. And there was no AC in this building. And we, we went through a summer in this thing. And, and God did a miracle. We still grew. <laughs> Sweaty, nasty. Brennan's up there praying, worshiping his heart out, sweating through his shirt and stuff. <laughs> It was, and they were like, why are there people still coming? Just the presence of God was so powerful, and people continue to come and continue to invite and continue to get saved, and we kind of continue to multiply services, and like we can only fit 120 as sardines in there, so we went to like several services, and then we leased another unit in this complex, and we knocked down the wall, and we kind of expanded double our capacity, so if you've been here for maybe four years or five years, you remember this one here as well. Um, no, this one's three years. If you've been here for at least three years. You know, you know this one, okay? And, and so we went back down to like two services, but we only stayed there, remember, for only like a few weeks, and it just kind of outgrew again, and we went to like four services in this thing, and we got, it was so crazy. We were having kids ministry in a tent in the parking lot. You remember that? It was nuts in Bakersfield, you guys, and so, so we're thinking like, what is like, is this it? We're capped out. This is capacity. Is this, is this it? And, and God said, no. I still have more. There is, there is still more that I have for you. And so what we did was we started looking for what's next. And I actually contacted the owner of this space, Tom Brandt. And this space, you guys, was empty for over seven years. No one had ever occupied this place. So we actually came into this space and we prayed over it after we talked to Tom. And, and I, it was, this was honestly the first place that we looked at when we decided to launch Discovery Church, but it was so far out of our price range. We're like, this is, this is way too much. So we kind of, we took Shiraz Court. Um, but then after growing and after a couple of years of doing it, we said, you know what? It's, I'm going to make an offer on that. I remember sitting with the trustees. Some of them, our elders, are in this service today. And I remember telling the elders, the people who oversee the finances of our church, I said, remember this moment. We were signing an, an official offer letter on this the, uh, to, to lease this building. And I told them, I said, remember this moment, because we were not offering what they wanted for this. It was far beneath what they wanted for it. But I told the elders, this is going to be a miracle. And you're going to have to remember this moment, because we're going to need the faith that this produces for the next step of faith that we're going to take, that we're going to need this. So remember this moment. And so we signed it, and we sent it off to Tom, and Tom contacts me just a few days later, and he, he says, Pastor Jason, I love you but you're crazy. No, I'm kidding. He didn't, he didn't say it like that, but he basically said, he said, I would love to. I want you to have it. Because throughout our time, I met Tom before we leased our building and launched the church and we got to know each other. And every couple of months I'd call him and I'd say, anyone at least that building yet? No, nobody. And, and, and I say, you know why? That's because it's God meant it to be for discovery. And I was just playing with him. I'm speaking it by faith, hoping like he believe it too. And hopefully if I tell him this enough, he'll believe it with me. And I'll just keep telling him, believe in it, man. Just this is going to be it, man. And, and so I give him the offer, and he basically says, I'm gonna, I wanted to call you because I respect you. I really want Discovery to have it. I was up all night. I was wrestling with this. I'm going to shoot you a letter, an offer back. I just wanted you to know before you know, I'll be sending you something. So, okay, I, I told him, Tom, you do what God puts on your heart to do. And we're just, we just know that God is going to take care of it. It's okay. You do what God tells you to do. We got off the phone. It wasn't but I think a, like a little over an hour or so later that they find Tom on White Lane in his truck, and he had a massive stroke. And, and they take him to the hospital. Um, everything obviously stops. We start praying and fasting. We visit our pastors. We all visit him in the hospital, pray for him. F I finally meet Connie, his wife, for the very first time, and, and uh, we're just believing for a miracle, but that, it didn't come. He went home to be with Jesus. And in that process, we're just praying, continue to pray and fast and go, okay, God, you know. I, I did the funeral for... Tom and got to meet more of the family, which more of the family are now members of Discovery and leaders and part of the team, the dream team here at Discovery. But it was a couple of weeks after the funeral that Connie calls me and, and says, um, you know, Jason, I want you to know that, that Tom loved you and he loved Discovery. 
And he wanted so bad. She, she told me that the night before, he was wrestling, and he was wrestling with her about wanting to have the discovery habits so, so bad. He wanted to, 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 and he didn't know what to do, and it was, he just was conflicted over it. And she said, Jason, it was his last wish, and I want to honor his last wish, and I'm going to give it to you at the offer you made. Listen, guys, we don't deserve this. We are reaping harvest and blessing and benefit that we did not sow. And, and then I come, when I'm signing for this lease, when we're signing for it, Connie tells me the story of how they even got this, this land, this whole, this whole land, his waters and everything. Did you know that this land was actually owned by Billy Graham? So Billy Graham, he had an executive, a part of his foundation, retired. And he gifted this land to this, to this guy who, who retired. And, and, and the Brandt family, Tom, they actually bought it from that, that retired person from Billy Graham's foundation. And they knew that this was anointed property. That's why when they started the laundromat, they said it's his waters because this is his land. And it sat empty for over seven years because they said whoever's going to be in this building is going to honor God, love God, and they're going to have godly values. So they were strict. They were saying no to this, no to that, no to that. And they didn't know, but God long in the making had discovery in mind for this building. Can I get an amen? We're reaping things that we didn't sow. That's what I'm saying, you guys. We, don't, we didn't deserve it. We didn't work for it. We're stepping into it, though. How good is God? And, I, and, I, and I'm here to tell you today, big announcement, that we are actually going to purchase this entire property from the Brandt family. His Waters laundromat next door is going to be our Discovery Kids building. We're going to have our kids ministry out of there. It's going to be awesome worship center and classrooms. We actually have plans to uh, do a Christian daycare and a preschool out of it as well. It's going to allow us now to expand even further in this place, expand a lobby. Can I get an amen? A bigger lobby, you guys, right? More restrooms. Woo! Yeah, yeah. All that great stuff. And then we're even going to connect the parking lots so we're a little bit better accessibility. So uh, here, here, Psalm 115. Why, why does God do all this? Not to us, Lord. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. Can we just pause and give God some glory right now? Come on, church. Will you give God some praise? Come on, church. To your name be the glory, Jesus. So here's, here's the big idea of today. What I, what I want to do, what I want to share with you is this. I want you to get this in your spirit. There is more. And so for the, for the next few minutes I have with you, I just, I, I, want, I want to talk to, to you. I'm not talking about discovery. There's more for discovery. No, no, no. Listen, for you, there is more that God has for your life. God wants to do more in your life. And if I could, the next few minutes, I'm going to stir up more inside of you. I'm going to stir up something that you would begin to see your life differently, to see more and start stepping towards more in your life. Look, because this is what the Bible says. Ephesians, Paul is writing to a church he planted, the church of Ephesus. And he says, now glory be to God, which is cool, right? Not to us, O Lord, but to your name. Be the glory. He's saying, hey, I'm, I'm, I, there are so much great things, and it ain't for us. It's for his name. Hey, more isn't for more of you. More is more glory to God. It's more, more of his kingdom. It's more, uh, it's more souls for his kingdom. Now glory be to God, who by his mighty power at work within us is able to do, say it out loud, is able to do far more, far more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream of. And I can dream pretty big. And God, and God says, I can dream bigger. Oh you, can, oh, you think you dream big? I can dream bigger. And he says, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, our hopes. I want to stir up some more inside of you. And I think what I want to do is help you to see more and start stepping towards more. And for a lot of us, we, we don't see. I think that we have a problem with our vision. Our view of things inhibits us from accessing this, this exceedingly abundant vision that God has for our life. We have, we have a, a vision problem. So earlier in, in the book of Ephesians, Paul again writing to this church that he planted in Ephesians chapter 1, he's like praying for him. He's like, man, there's so much more. I want you to get it. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be 
enlightened. And when I first read this verse years ago, I thought to myself, Paul, you need an anatomy lesson because your eyes ain't in your heart. Your eyes are in your head, Paul. What are you talking about? But I come to find out that Paul is right. You don't, listen, you don't see with the eyes in your head. You see with the eyes in your heart. You see through the, the filter of your pain, the filter of your past, the filter of your hurts, the filter of your prejudices, the filter of your, you see through your heart. And Paul says, man, I want, I pray, man, there's so much for you, and I pray that your heart will be set free, that it will be full of light. Why? In order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incredibly great power for us who believe. Paul says, look, the reason why you, you, you don't see this is because your heart, you, you can't see that there's glorious riches available for you, inheritance for you in Christ. You can't see that you're called. Some of you don't even see it. We don't see the incomparably great power available to us. He would later say it's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. And we don't, it's ours. It's for us. And he is for us. We just don't see it. Why? Because the eyes of our heart need to be set free. We need some enlightenment. So today, what I'm going to do is I want to help you see differently, okay? I want, I want to help you see differently, and then I'm going to help you start stepping towards this, this exceedingly abundant life that God has for you, this more that God has for you. But first, we've got to fix your vision. All of us, I mean, it's easy to get our vision skewed. Take some notes with me. Here's, here's the first wrong view we have. Number one is that we have a wrong view of self. We have a wrong view of self. So some of us are not seeing ourselves. We have a poor self-assessment. And listen, God, God sees greatness in you that you do not see in yourself. So we see ourselves we see ourselves through our insecurities. We think things like, man, who am I? Who am I? I'm nobody. Or we see ourselves through our fear. We say, oh, I don't know if I could do that. What if this happens? And what if it, or we see ourselves through our inadequacy. We say, well, I'm not enough, man. And you're measuring yourself by yourself instead of the God who is in you. And listen, you are inadequate until God shows up. And then you are more than a conqueror through him who loved you. Amen, somebody? Some of us have a wrong view of ourselves, though, and it's affecting us from, from walking in that more, that exceeding abundant plan that God has for us. So this is what God says in 1 Peter chapter 2. This is what God says you are. You are a chosen generation. Did you know that? That God chose you. Like of all the people on the earth, listen, God picked you. You are chosen by God. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You are his own special people. That's who you are. And it's not so you can puff out your chest and walk all like high and mighty. No, so that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his glorious light. See, if you're going to walk in this, if you're going to walk in the exceeding abundantly more, you got to get the right vision for yourself. you got to know who you are and see yourself the way God sees you. Here's the second thing you need to do. First is the wrong vision of yourself. The second, we have a wrong vision of people. We have the wrong view of people. And, and you can almost always find whatever you're looking for in people. So be careful what you're looking for. Okay, you, you can... If you change the way you see people, the people you see will change. See, we're, we're, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Is the, the filter that you're seeing people through? I, even if you if you start seeing, if you look for sin and issues in me, you find them. I'm telling you, every day you'll find them. The Bible says, "Whether in many words, sin is not absent." I get up here and I speak a lot of words every day, and I put my foot in my mouth every Sunday because I'm not perfect. And if you keep looking for it, you'll find it. You'll find it. We have a wrong view. We, we see people differently. And, and people, if we're on, people bug you way too much. We see people as problems. We see people as obstacles. And, and, and this, I'm telling you, you cannot leave a legacy if you have the wrong view of people. You cannot make a difference and make an impact if you have the wrong view of people. Jesus had a different view of people. Matthew chapter 9, it says that when Jesus saw people, when he saw the crowds, he didn't see them how we saw them. He had compassion on them. And I think we forget, we forget that all around us are people who are, who are lost, who are broken, who are hopeless, 
who their souls have not, don't have the forgiveness and the grace offered in Jesus Christ. That just miles away from this building right here, people are being killed, people are being prostituted and trafficked and addicted and enslaved. And, and listen, we can't forget that because when we forget that, we forget why we're here, why we pray, why we serve, why we give. You can't forget this, church. We got to have the right view. Jesus saw them differently. When he saw people, he had compassion on them. Because, look at this, because he didn't, he didn't say, because they need to get a job. I mean, if they would just get a job. If they just, I mean, it's not my problem. It ain't my problem. That's not my problem. It's not my side of town. That's not my people. No, he saw something. He, guys, he saw something different. This is, he, he, he saw the real issue. And the real issue here, from the master's perspective, he said, no, that's not their fault. This is a broken world. This world is broken. The system is broken. Our human nature is fallen. Hey, no, these people, they're harassed and they're helpless. And the reason why, he says, is because they don't have, they don't have me. They don't have a shepherd to lead and guide them to greener pastures. That's why. That's why they're broken. That's why they're hurting. That's, that's why. And he had compassion on them because they needed a shepherd. And we have the wrong view of people and it will rob you of the, that life, that exceedingly abundant more life that God has for you. And here's the last one that's probably the most important. That is some of you have a wrong view of God. See, we forget that, that we serve a miracle-working, powerful, above and beyond anything we could ever imagine kind of God. We forget that. And, we, and so we're not, we don't dream God-sized dreams anymore. We dream only dreams that we can attain. We, we only dream things that we can accomplish ourselves. And I want to challenge you to seek God for his dream for your life, to say, you know what? I'm going to go after this, God, and I can't do it unless you show up. Uh, man, that's where life gets fun, church. That's the exhilarating, abundant life that God always promised for you, living on that edge of faith of saying, God, if you don't show up in this, I'm going to fall flat on my face. I'm serious. Are you hearing me, you guys? I want this for you. This was the life that God always intended for you to live, that you would have this right view of God. I love Jeremiah 32, 17. You ought to memorize this church or write it down, put it on your mirror, put it somewhere. He says, ah, oh, sovereign Lord, you've made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arms. Say it with me. Nothing is too hard for you. That's the God we serve. Look, I want to I partner with God in doing something impossible, church. I want to. I want to serve. I want to be a part of a church that's in over their head. That's in over their head, going, "Oh my goodness!" Like I've told God, God, I don't think I could do this. And God goes, "I know. Just watch." Yeah. Amen, somebody. That's the kind of dream God has for you—a God-sized dream. I'm just here to stir you up, church. There is more, and God is not finished with you yet. Will you receive that today, okay? God is not finished with you yet. We got to fix how we see. We got to fix how, this, Joshua chapter three, verse five. Now, in Deuteronomy, he says, hey, there's a promise for you, and God's got, God's got this promised land for you. Joshua was the one to actually carry them into the promised land, but he gave them the secret of how they're going to do it, how they were going to get there. And he said, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves. That sounds like a, like, I know, a Bible word, a religious word, consecrate yourselves. Here's what it means. Listen, fully devote. Here, here's the key. You want to you see God uh, go before you? Wanna, you want to step into the promised land? Man, fully devote yourself to God for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Okay, so Listen, there is, there is something that you can, because maybe today it's not amazing. It's not amazing. Let's be honest. Some of you, it's not amazing, okay? But Joshua is telling us, he's giving us a secret. There's something you can actually do today that can influence a better tomorrow. You can, if you fully devote yourself to God, he says, tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things among you. I want to, what does it look like? What does that look like to be fully devoted to God? I, to help me teach this full devotion and what that looks like so we can all see amazing things in our life, God moving among us. I want to help you see what it looks like in, in, in a 
person in the Bible, could have chosen a, a lot of them, but, but Nehemiah in the Bible is someone who, who kind of, who is a picture of full devotion. He had the right view of himself. He had the right view of people. He had the right view of God. He got this God-sized dream for his life, and he would not be deterred from it. The people told him, there, you got no business dreaming that dream, Nehemiah. You're nobody. You're nothing. You're, you, you got no business dreaming that big. Who are you? And Nehemiah was so devoted to God, he would not be deterred by other people pulling him down off of his dream or even by the enemy distracting him and trying to derail him from accomplishing God's vision for his life. He was totally devoted. And because of that, he saw amazing things. I want you to see it. Nehemiah chapter one. Now it says that the, those who survived the exile and are back in the province. This now is the Israelites that already inherited the promised land. They were once totally devoted, but they done messed up, okay? And foreign invaders came into Israel, destroyed it, took people captive, burned down the walls, tore down the temple, all that stuff. Many years later, they were allowed to start to trickle back. Some of the Israelites started going back to their homeland, to Israel. And it says those who survived the exile and are back in the province of Israel are in great trouble and disgrace, so his heart started to break for the people. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. Nehemiah says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. He got a burden from God. He got a dream from God in that moment, a burden to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And I'm going to tell you right now, every one of you here have a burden, a dream, and a unique calling from God. And the sooner you get working on it, the sooner your life is going to see amazing things. Amen, Amen somebody? Yeah. You, you got a unique vision for your life. So what, what did it take? What is that full devotion that Nehemiah, Nehemiah represented for us? And what can we learn from Nehemiah? Because maybe you're here today and you're like, well, that sounds good, Pastor. Whew, more, exceeding, abundant. That's great. But when you look up at the reality, what you see is burned walls, is brokenness. All right? Let's, let, let, that's the reality of some of us, okay? We say, yeah, that's great. I see that God has that, and I see the scriptures, and it sounds good, Pastor. But when I look up, my marriage is broken. I'm going through a divorce. I am divorced. I lost my business. I lost my job. This is where it's at. My relationships or my finances. I want to believe that, but how do I get from here to there? How do I walk this out? How do I experience that promise in my life? And I, listen, listen, I promise you this. If you will be totally devoted to God, I promise you, you will see amazing things among you. I promise you that. If you will totally devote yourself to God, you will see amazing things. So what, is that, what does that look like then? Write it down. It looks like this. What is it going to take? Whatever it takes. <laughs> Write it down. Whatever. God is looking for some whatever it takes kind of servants. Some people will say, I'm not going to be turned. I'm not going to be stopped. In order for you to accomplish more, the purpose God has for you, the vision and dream that he has for your life, it's going to take a whatever it takes kind of determination. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. So listen, you, you cannot accomplish a God-sized dream with a pint-sized devotion. Amen, somebody. Come on. Everything, let me say it this way, everything worthwhile for your life, everything, everything, the dream God has for you is uphill. It's uphill. The problem is, Many of us have uphill dreams and downhill habits. And downhill is easy. Most of us are living a downhill habits and a downhill, we're living a downhill life. It's easy. We're coasting. You don't need any energy to go downhill. You don't need determination to go downhill. Gravity just takes you. You could be sleeping your way through life, just coasting downhill. You got this uphill dream, but you think you're going to get there coasting downhill. Uh, downhill's easy. Uphill is hard. Uphill takes energy, takes focus, takes determination, takes time, takes, it, it's whatever it takes. That's what it takes to get uphill. Nehemiah 4, 6 says this. So we built the wall. He actually, yeah, he went, Nehemiah went, and they built the wall. The entire wall was joined together, half the height now. For the people, look at this, had a mind to work. 
Turn to your neighbor and tell him, get to work. Come on, somebody. Get to work. You want to accomplish that uphill dream that God has for you? You better, you can't do it with a mind of complaint, a mind of criticism, a mind of complacency, a mind of, 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 of easy goes it. You, you need a mind to work. I'll tell you right now, you can't stop me. Devil can't stop me. You know why? I got a mind to work. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to keep growing. I'm going to keep building. I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to keep climbing this mountain. I'm going to do whatever it takes. You can't stop me. Come on, somebody. You do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Nehemiah 6, he continues, says, The wall, when it was finished on the 25th day of some weird month, in 52 days. Check that out. 52 days they rebuilt this thing. What took 100 years, they couldn't do. They did in 52 days. Why? Because they did whatever it takes. It just took someone to say, okay, no, nope, I'm going to climb this mountain. Whatever it takes, 52 days, they accomplished it. And it happened when all our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes. For they perceived that this work was done by God. Wow. So which one was it, Nehemiah? Did you guys do the work or was it done by God? You want to know the answer to that question? Yes. That's the answer. Yes, they did the work, but God empowered them. It's that incredibly great power that is available to us who believe God empowered them with this determination to complete the work, whatever it takes. You want to accomplish? I mean, I feel like a coach today. You know what I mean? I'm like, I'm like, come on. Everything God has for you, that dream he has for you is on top of that hill. Don't you quit now. Whatever it takes, you keep climbing. You keep believing. You keep working. You keep going. Whatever it takes. So whatever it takes, that's with, here's number two, whatever it takes, with whatever I have. Whatever it takes, with whatever I have. Listen, listen. Stop waiting for what you think you need and stop using and start using what you have. So, so, so stop, stop using what you, stop waiting for what you want, what you think you need and start, start using what God has already given you because I promise you this, listen, God has already given you everything you need to do everything he's called you to do today. He has not withheld any good thing from you. He has given you everything you need, whatever it takes, with whatever I have. Moses, he only had a shepherd's staff when he went before the Pharaoh and said, let my people go. David only had a sling and a few stones, and he charged at that Philistine warrior giant named Goliath. The, that widow of Zarephath, she only had some empty jars when she cried out to Elijah, help save my family. It might not look like much. But when whatever, whatever you have is devoted to God, it becomes everything you need. Oh, man. Whatever it takes. See, God has, given, God has already given you what you need. It's in your hand. And if you would just stop focusing on what's not in your hand and start using what's in your hand, it'll become whatever you need. God has given it to you. Whatever it takes. That's what, that's what, that's what full devotion, total devotion looks like. I'm going to do whatever it takes with whatever I have. Nehemiah 4, 17 talks about how they, they now the enemies, the, Israel had enemies. They didn't want them to rebuild. So the enemies would come and do night raids and attacks and they would even kill. They were trying to play mind games and stuff like that to just detour and derail the work of God and the dream that God gave Nehemiah. So Nehemiah says, here's what we're going to do. You ain't stopping me. You, you can't stop me. I'm going to do whatever it takes. He said, this is what I'm going to do. We're going to continue working with one hand. <laughs> We're going to work and build with one hand, and the other hand, we're going to be ready for the fight. Uh, whatever it takes, with whatever I have, and can I tell you something about that? God, everything you have was given to you by God. Whatever you have is already God's. It's already His. You just need to devote it back to Him. God has given you, whatever you have is a gift from God. You don't own anything. So which some of you go, wait a second. What are you trying to tell me I didn't work to get what I have? I know I, I work to get what I have. Oh, really? Where'd you get the, the mind to work with? Where'd you get the energy to accomplish that work? Where did you get the intellect and the gifts and the talents and the skills? Where did you get the breath that you're breathing to accomplish what you are doing? Everything you have is a gift from God. 
whatever it takes, with whatever I have, number three, write it down, whatever it takes, with whatever I have, wherever God has me. See, here's, some, some of you are underestimating your current assignment. You're underestimating your current place, and you say, you know what, I'll start trying harder then. You know, when I, when I have when I have more time, I'll start serving. When I, when I have more margin in my finances, I'll start giving. No, you won't. No, you won't. If you don't know how to live with kingdom priorities now, you won't live with kingdom priorities later. You won't. Because you think what comes with that promotion is, 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 yeah, sure, it's more opportunities and more fun, but it also comes with more opposition and more temptation. New levels, new devils. That's what happens. <laughs> Nehemiah, Nehemiah, rebuilt that wall because he did whatever it takes with whatever I have, wherever I have me. But that wasn't a switch he turned on. I want you to see this. He was a slave in a foreign land. And, and how, he, how he reacted and, and, and responded to his assignment as a slave paved way to rebuilding that wall. So he didn't wait to turn on. He did whatever it takes with whatever he has as a slave. Look what it says in Nehemiah that the king, he was actually a part of the king's court, his inner circle, one of the most trusted people of the king. He worked his way with excellence and hard work. He climbed uphill. He was, he was putting in the time and putting in the effort long before the wall got built. He was a faithful servant, faithful so much so when he was praying and he was fasting and he was so sad and burned, burdened by the people and the brokenness of his, of his country, the king Artaxerxes says, hey, why, why is your face so sad, Nehemiah? I mean, I love you, Nehemiah. Ask anything and I'll give it to you. And you go read the story. The king actually writes a decree and gives it to Nehemiah to let, let the Israelites go back to their homeland. And then he gives them all these resources and cedar and supplies and everything to rebuild. Listen, the reason why he was able to do that because Nehemiah, even as a slave, did whatever it takes with whatever he had, wherever he was. Be faithful to your assignment that you have right now. Be faithful in the place, in the assignment that God has for you right now. So some of you go, oh, okay, fine. Yeah, I guess, I guess I'll fake it till I make it. No, 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 no. I'm not saying fake it till you make it. I'm saying faith it till you make it. There's a difference. Faith it till you make it. You believe things that are not as though they were. You, you see, Nehemiah was a slave, but he didn't see himself as a slave. He said, I, that might even be, be my assignment right now, but I'm a chosen people. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm a holy nation. I'm not no slave. I know who I am. And my people may be crushed and enslaved, but I know, I know who they really are. We're God's people. And I know who my God is. My God is the God of the impossible, the exceedingly abundantly above what I can even imagine kind of God. Be faithful to where you are today because God has given you a gift today. Today, you have opportunities, opportunities that are available to you to get up that hill, to keep climbing, to keep working, to get that dream. It ain't going to be easy, but he'll give you incredibly great power to go get it. Ephesians chapter 5 says this. So be careful then. Be careful how you live. Don't live foolishly, but live wise, he says. Making the most of every opportunity. Because these days we're living, he says, are, they're evil. So here, you want to you know what the key is to total devotion? You want to be totally devoted? Here's the key. Go all in. That, that's actually what total devotion is. When you, are, when you are totally devoted, you're not half in, half out. I'm saying go all in. Make, make Jesus the Lord of every area of your life. Make him the Lord of your career. Make him the Lord of your hobbies. Make him the Lord of your marriage, the Lord of your, your friends. Make him the Lord of your finances. Like Make him the Lord of every area. Go all in with God. And I've been given this challenge for six years now here at Discovery Church. Here it is. Give God 12 months. Mark the date right now, September 8th, 2019. I, I dare you. Give God 12 months of your life of full devotion. If we were honest, most of us in here have not done. We've held back parts of our life. We've held back. And I just challenge you, see what, see what happens when you go all in. Just see. What was, what's, the, what's it going to hurt? You know, one year of all your life, what's it going to hurt? 
one year, 12 months, and 12 months from now, you can look back and I promise you, you're going to say, okay, maybe I'm not where I want to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. Go all in with God. Consecrate yourselves. Totally devote yourselves because the Lord is going to do amazing things among you. Here, let me put it all together. Look, whatever it takes, with whatever I have, wherever God has me, I'm going all in. Hey, let's say it out loud together, guys. One, two, three, full voice. Whatever it takes, with whatever I have, wherever God has me, I'm going all in. And the Lord will do amazing things among you. Do me a favor. Can you take out this, this bulletin? There's some information in there about, about this building campaign that we're doing. We're calling it all in, actually. And if I could take a moment, and I'm just, can I talk to the family of Discovery, the people who call Discovery home for a moment? If you're a visitor, I'm so glad that you're here. And I hope that you are stirred today to see something greater and start stepping to something greater. But I need to have a family moment because we're stepping into a phase of our life as a church that we've never been before. We have two years left on this lease and we need to shore up the future of Discovery. We need, to, we need to secure the legacy of discovery and thank God that the owner, Connie Brandt, of, this, of the property here has given us these two years to raise the money to purchase the property. So our goal in the next two years is to raise $1.5 million. $1.5 million. And we've never, guys, we, we, this, is the biggest, this is the biggest faith set we would have. And I'm telling you, it may, be, it may look like that now, but the next one will be even bigger. God will give us, he, he'll challenge us at the appropriate measures that, that we need. But this is the biggest one today. So if I could talk to the family of Discovery real quick, we have a card in there. And on that card is, is and we've never done this, like this pledge form for you to, to prayerfully consider what all in looks like for you financially. Okay, and what we're calling, we're calling this, um, we're calling you founding members. Founding members, because we're still getting, we're just getting started, you guys, and we need to, to actually have our first stable home ever. Um, in purchasing this property. So, so for those of you that want to be and are part of the family, you're a founding member, what that means is you're saying yes to the tithe. And there's a spot on there on top of that card that says, yep, that's me, I'm going to commit to tithe. I'm going to do that. And, and I'm not twisting any arms or anything like that. You guys know that's not how we roll. For the family of Discovery here, if this is an area of you that you haven't committed to this yet, I would challenge you. We're not going to raise, you guys, we can't, we're not going to raise $1.5 million on pledges alone. We're actually going to separate some of our tithe. We have to. We have to separate some of our resources to, able, to be able to accomplish that. So maybe this is an area for you to go all in and take a tithe challenge. I say, you know what? I'm going to go all in. I'm just going to see what God does when I put him as Lord of my finances. Okay? And if, that's, and if you're a founding member and you're part of the house here, check that off. I want to know you're with me, man. I want to know you're running up this mountain with me to the dream. Amen? Check that off. And then, and then there, to, because it may, look, it may sound like a lot, $1.5 million. So I wanted to show you what that even could look like and how easily we can attain it if all of us go all in. Look at this. If 40 people give 500, 100 give 250, 100 give 100, we're almost there. That's it. And some of you can give $500. That's $12,000 over the course of two years or, or 6000 over the course. And I want you to know, listen, I'm not telling you to do anything I haven't done. I did it first. I was the first one to fill out the pledge, okay? It was months ago. And then I gave it to my, the trustees, the elders that oversee the finances. I gave it to them. And, and many of them committed. All of them committed. And then our staff, just a handful of people, honestly, we just said, we're, we're going all in. We've already, we've already raised $35,000 pledge. Just a handful of us. What, 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 imagine what we could do if all of us went all in. If all of us did. And so even if you're here today and you want to you wanna make like a one-time commitment and what we're calling a legacy partner, because maybe you're here today and you just, you're blessed by God in this, in this area and you have a gift of generosity. Praise God. If you want to make an investment into the, into the ministry and into this, this purchasing this property so that it can continue to be a place of living waters where this city will continue to come and drink from living waters and never thirst again, you feel, put on your card there, write the word legacy. We have a CPA that's a part of our finance team and, and free of charge, he'll connect with you and help you out with any paperwork and resources to make it make it beneficial. It, maybe you own a business or something like that. You say, you know what? I want to I invest my, some of my business. That You write on legacy. If you have a one-time gift or you want to invest something like that, write legacy on there and we'll reach out to you to see how we can leverage that for the kingdom. Amen? Amen. In a moment, we're going to worship God in our giving. Before we do that, I want to pray for you, you guys.
Can we just bow our heads?